So, um, so, so um, our first, um, our first uh, collaborator for this um, in Dubai has been the Dubai Future Foundation, which is um, uh, a foundation under the Minister of Cabinet Affairs and the Future. Uh, I like that they have that ministry. Uh, and uh, they have basically dedicated uh, a serious sum of, uh, uh, of money to... Um, trying to ensure that Dubai becomes the innovation hub uh, of the region. And, uh, and the last project that I'd like to share with you, oh yeah, of course, the, the vision is really that this should really be the beginning of, of, a, of an interconnected region and of course eventually interconnected planet and, and maybe uh, accessory uh, uh, satellites. Um, but um, our client um, is, uh, <laughs> is the Dubai Future Foundation and uh, the, the minister uh, of the future uh, commissioned us uh, to uh, to look at uh, you know with uh, with the, 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 the whole sort of plan from uh, from SpaceX and uh, and NASA and uh, um, and, uh, and Blue Origin uh, Jeff Bezos uh, uh, rocket project to get to Mars. W what would it actually uh, take to uh, envision a city on Mars, an Emirati city on Mars, in 99 years? Um, so uh, I'll just share you some of the some of the thoughts that goes into to this, but I, but it's strangely relevant to uh, to, uh, to to being an architect on Earth as well. So uh, so why Mars? So we started analyzing the different alternatives, and of all the solid planets or moons, um, the the most the most interesting ones are actually the moons of Jupiter and and Mars, um, and it's basically because Mars is our uh, immediate neighbor. Uh, the moons of, of Saturn and Jupiter are really, really uh, interesting, but they are sort of between three and, and six years uh, far away. So uh, uh, you can get to Mars in, uh, in just uh, three months, uh, which is like a lot more exciting. It's also within, uh, you know, the comfortable uh, uh, temperature. Let's say uh, you have Venus and Mercury with temperatures up to 450 degrees. Also, the, the atmosphere of Venus is, uh, is sulfuric acid. So not super nice. And then, of course, when you get further out than Mars, it becomes incredibly cold. So Mars actually has summer temperatures at equator up to 20 degrees Celsius uh, and, and down to minus 150 on the poles, which is, of course, quite cold. Um, also, when you look at gravity, uh, you know, um, Ju Jupiter has a crushing gravity of, uh, uh, of 200 and, uh, 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 2 and a half G, which would basically make everybody crumble. Uh, 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 let's say like a, 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 a hundred kilo guy would be 253 kilos on, uh, on Jupiter. Um, on, on Mars, you have a 38% uh, gravity, which means that 100 kilos suddenly turns into 38 kilos. It's the fastest diet anyone can, uh, can go through. Also, when you look at the, at the weather systems, actually Mars has quite mild weather, uh, even compared to, to Earth when it comes to storms. And you have like... 2,000 kilometer storms on Neptune, which makes it almost uh, uh, impossible. Also, when you look at atmosphere, Mars has a very light atmosphere. That's maybe the one challenge.
Earth has a 24-hour day cycle, Mars has a 24-hour and 40-minute day cycle, where, for instance, Mercury has a 175-day cycle. So uh, when the sun sets, it takes uh, you know, uh, three months before it rises again. Uh, it's quite nice that it's almost the same in, uh, in Mars. Also, just to show how crazy the seasons can be on Uranus, it's, it's per perpendicular to uh, the sun, the axis, which means that uh, if you're close to the, in the north of, of Uranus, then uh, it'll be daylight uh, and summer for 21 years, followed by a winter and night of 21 years, which means that it's, it's, it is quite nice when it's a little bit more similar to, uh, to Earth. Um, then also, um, the moon, our most immediate heavenly body, has none of the things that are crucial for life, which is water and carbon. You have all of that on Mars. Uh, Mars doesn't have any uh, magnetic field, which means that they have more radiation. But we try to sort of analyze almost like a real estate perspective. Mars is incredibly good. It has a little bit too much radiation for humans, but, uh, but enough, uh, not enough to, uh, to damage plants. It's half the diameter of, of Earth, but because it has no oceans, it has the exact same amount of surface area. So it would really double uh, uh, the, the, the available surface. Um, obviously, the, the blue planet and the red planet. Um, there is actually Atacama Desert in Chile is the, is the sp sp place most similar to Mars. You can also see that once all the green uh, and, and blue is gone, we have the same, uh, uh, the, the same minerals. Like the two planets are almost identical. Um, and it's also very cold and dry in At Atacama. But then a miracle happens uh, at night. We all know that the sunsets on Earth are red. Uh, on Mars, because of the very fine-grained particles, only the blue light can pass through the atmosphere and the sunsets become blue, uh, which I think we will all enjoy once we, uh, we go there. Uh, and, um, and of course, we've actually been exploring Mars since the 60s, so we have a lot of really good uh, footage. Uh, uh, the Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, uh, has been sending back satellite photos, uh, so we have seen evidence of frozen uh, water. We've seen the poles, which is uh, dry ice, frozen CO2 expanding and contracting. We know a lot about the landscapes, the, the craters, uh, the lava flows, uh, the, uh, the, the sand dunes, uh, a dried out archipelago, because it used to be half covered by, uh, by an ocean. And we've seen uh, tornadoes, uh, we've seen landslides. Um, and also we've been having uh, these guys driving around uh, curiosity uh, is still active. Uh, we've seen uh, morning uh, frost uh, on the desert. So we, we have like a lot of sort of uh, knowledge uh, uh, and sort of similar vistas as you might find somewhere on, uh, on Earth. So there's a lot, a lot to like. We have a few challenges. Too much radiation for humans, very low pressure, uh, quite cold temperature, no breathable air and no uh, ready-to-use water. Uh, if we look at where, where we would land, we've just analyzed some of the sort of uh, tested uh, landing sites, and, and basically you might want to be as low as possible. The blue is where it's, uh, it's more shallow, because the lower you are to the ground, the heavier or the denser the atmosphere is, and the warmer the temperatures will be. Um, so somewhere in the blue, uh, the blue regions. There's also, this is Valles Marineris. It's a 4,000 kilometer long, Grand Canyon up to seven kilometers deep. Uh, it's the deepest, uh, 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 the biggest uh, canyon in the, in the solar system. So, so before we would go there, we would sort of, where can we learn from? And we just looked at a, a few sort of places on Earth. Tunisia, what seems to be a lifeless desert, is actually uh, a, 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 an inhabited uh, village. These kind of structures that are excavated out of the ground to protect from the elements, the thermal mass uh, of the soil, the shade, uh, the natural shade from, uh, from the surroundings, uh, a uniform uh, material, cozy interiors, uh, um, sort of naturally integrated into the environment. Another example in Arizona, in the Canyonlands, again, something that looks uninhabited uh, was actually the, the shelter for uh, a series of, uh, of towns and villages that are half uh, uh, excavated, half built with, uh, with the same rocks that they inhabit. But again, the, the, the mass of the rock would protect uh, from the sun, uh, in this case, uh, and from the temperatures, but on Mars, from the radiation. Um, and finally, of course, in the Arctics, uh, in the cold, 
uh, using the insulating properties of snow because of the trapped uh, air particles in the water uh, and the sort of compact forms of, of spheres uh, in earth mounts or, or, or igloos. Um, so anyway, one, one uh, person uh, from NASA, Robert Zubrin, that has inspired us, he talked about Roald Amundsen, uh, uh, the first man to reach the South Pole. And when, what allowed him to do it was instead of importing his home environment, he embraced the local environment and adopted a live off the land strategy he learned from the Eskimo. So in the same way, we have to become Martians. We have to l learn how to live off the, uh, the land on, on Mars. So um, just looking at how to, to build a city on Mars, uh, it would cost um, 6,600 US uh, dollars to get one kilo of cargo to Mars. And buildings are quite heavy, so it could be quite expensive. So, of course, in the beginning, we have to bring our habitats. Eventually, we could maybe bring just the machines to build our buildings. And finally, we should be able to, to extract everything from Mars. Also, we need to be able to create a sustainable, closed uh, ecosystem. When you look at the needs of one uh, human being, you need uh, two liters of water uh, and sort of a handful of ingredients, uh, 3,000 calories per, per day. Uh, to deliver that, you need plants. Uh, Basically, when you look at the needs of a human and the needs of plants, those two ecosystems must be tied together into a single system. So basically, if we start looking at what do we have on Mars, uh, we have regolith, which is the, the minerals. They consist of, of meteorites, basalt, and, and sands. So to start with, if we start sorting the, the regolith, we can get uh, uh, ice. Uh, that can give us water. Uh, we can get basalt stones and we can get uh, fine grain sand. Uh, with the water and the, and the sand, we can make bricks, we can make Martian concrete, we can make ceramics. And we can sort the sand into its constituent components, silicia, aluminum, and iron oxide. Uh, we all know this to be there. With that, we can create uh, aluminum, we can make glass, and we can make uh, photovoltaics. Uh, with photovoltaics, we can make uh, energy. Uh, with energy, we can actually make electrolysis where you can split water into uh, uh, um, hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, the atmosphere of Mars is 93% CO2, uh, which, which is also why eventually plants can, uh, can live there. With a Sabatier reactor, it's a chemical process, you use hydrogen and CO2 to create methane, uh, and as a byproduct, methane together with uh, oxygen is a perfect rocket propellant, so we can actually make our own fuel so we can fly back. So we don't have to bring uh, a fuel there, we can actually create a uh, sort of a bridge. Uh, um, the Sabatia has a byproduct of C, uh, carbon uh, monoxide and, and more water. Carbon monoxide can be used with iron oxide to create steel. Uh, with another chemical reaction together with water, you can actually create different kinds of plastics, hard plastics and soft plastics. Uh, the soft plastics, of, like the plastics, of course, we want to recycle them, but we can also make transparent uh, membranes to create inflatable environments. And finally, with the water, we can actually grow uh, plants. We can use root zones to treat the, the water as a water treatment. So that means we can start using water for recreation, for aeroponics, aquaponics, hydroponics, for food production. And finally, we can sustain hu human life. So we actually have everything in place on Mars to create a man-made ecosystem. We might, on Earth, in Western Europe, we have a roughly 150 square meters per person. We would make a little bit less on, on Mars. Um, the radiation on Mars is the main problem, but if we just look at it, on Mars you get 110 MSV uh, uh, on the surface. A radiologist is recommended not to have more than 50 uh, uh, on a year. Uh, the astronauts on the ISS can actually get 180. So we looked at a typical American spends no more than 7.6% of their day outdoors. So if we say, if we only spend 18% uh, in, a, uh, in a sort of a, uh, in a, uh, let's say four hours per day outside, we get down to 18 MSV, which is less than what an air, airline crew uh, is exposed to. So where, you know, on earth you have indoor, outdoor, you'll get 
much more different gradients on, uh, on Mars. And finally, sort of learning from the different uh, techniques, we say that we need excavation, we need 3D printing, and we need uh, inflatable environments. Inflatable environments are very good at containing a pressurized environment, but they are not radiation safe and they are not safe for meteors. 3D printing you can do with very little machinery, with a local machi uh, uh, machinery. It's hard to make fully uh, dense. And finally, excavation is perfect for, uh, for radiation. So none of them work on their own, but when you join them, they actually answer all the, uh, the needs. So, um, yeah, obviously you end up with these sort of inflatable uh, membrane structures, a Kevlar net. So, so we sort of developed this structure of how uh, a village could gradually grow on, uh, on Mars. But, but even for an architect, uh, a 99-year timeline is a little bit too slow. So, uh, <laughs> as a prototype, uh, in four years in Dubai, uh, we'll be uh, testing uh, what, what, what's going to be the Mars Science Center. It's going to be attracting uh, uh, labs from different institutions, academic and, uh, and, and companies, to do testing that is relevant. Uh, hydroponics is the MIT City Farm. Uh, to create a campus that is all devoted to the idea of living uh, uh, outside planet Earth. Um, so it's going to have uh, permanent exhibitions, it's going to be uh, uh, an educational facility, it's going to be a visitor facility, it's going to be a research facility, but all built as a prototype. So when you go there, uh, you can actually feel it's going to be 3D printed with the local sand, it's going to be inside pressurized environments. So when you go there, you can really feel what it's going to feel like to, uh, to be living on Mars. Uh, it's, it's even going to look like Mars. Um, also, a funny thing, when you 3D print, rounded corners are actually more uh, effective uh, than uh, rectangular boxes. So you'll even have a, a kind of a language. So it's not going to look like living in some kind of weird tin can. It's going to be almost like living in a charming medieval uh, town. Also, water. Hydrogen is the most effective shield against radiation. So when you would need seven meters of rock, only one meter of water is enough to protect you from the radiation. So you might actually end up having skylights that are actually uh, pools. Uh, so this is not only beautiful, it's also a very effective way to get both daylight uh, and radiation protection on Mars. Um, so in four years, the idea is that you, you'll have these gardens. Also, it's, it's very important that everything is very lush and green because on Mars, you really need to effectively use uh, every uh, area of uh, climatized environment to produce food. It'll be a, a, a prototype uh, facility in, in actually experimenting with very effective forms of, uh, of agriculture. The, the only difference really between, uh, or the significant difference between Mars and, and Dubai is that it's a lot warmer in Dubai. Uh, so, uh, so we have to sort of develop this uh, membrane. So like we're gonna use, uh, uh, on, on, on Mars, you would use uh, the Earth for geothermal heating. We use it for, uh, for Earth cooling. Uh, we, we have to, of course, create a, a closed ecosystem with water, because both on Mars and in Dubai, water is very precious. And finally, uh, this kind of uh, inflatable membrane that is the, uh, the, uh, the climatized environment is made in such a way that by changing the pressure, you can join uh, two different patterns to open and close. So something that is like 50% uh, transparent can become almost entirely opaque. So something that is both good for a greenhouse can also be good for uh, uh, a lecture hall. Um, so wh why is this uh, relevant? And, and a lot of people sort of, sort of argue that shouldn't we focus on being good at inhabiting our own planet before we start messing with another one? But I think the two things are actually quite similar because when you look at eight of the um, 17 uh, sustainable development goals of the United Nations, efficient uh, crops, water purification techniques, uh, renewable power, responsible consumption, sustainable cities, circular economy, innovative infrastructure, infrastructure independent of travel, uh, ecosystem engineering, climate neutral construction, all of these elements will be necessary to develop in order to be able to uh, inhabit Mars. And they are the same solutions that will actually make us good custodians of, uh, uh, of Earth. 
So if you imagine over the next 150 years, Mars could actually transform slowly uh, from the red planet that we know today to something that looks much more similar. This is what Mars would look like with uh, liquid water on the surface and, uh, and a breathable atmosphere, quite similar to, uh, to our, our current planet. And, and I just think as, as the last uh, departing thought, um, when the first astronaut took um, uh, a picture uh, of, of Earth rising over the, the moon, it, 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 it gave this sort of notion of, of, of really thinking about where we come from as a home that, that unites us all uh, in, a, in a sort of mu mutual uh, uh, destiny. Um, you could also imagine that in future generations, standing on Mars, you would actually see uh, Earth as a blue, sky, as a blue star uh, on the sky. And you can imagine 50 years down the road, uh, like uh, our gra grandchildren, uh, 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 sort of uh, what, what they would be thinking about their blue origin, uh, uh, looking, uh, standing on the planet that they, that they will now call home. So, so in that sense, I, I think maybe with this as the, as the, final, uh, as the, fi as the final image, I, I think there's something quite interesting because I mean, I mean, I, I started with looking at how we designed a sports hall uh, for my old high school, is that over the last 17 years, I think we've been sort of consistently interested in a, in a handful of, of ideas, uh, hedonistic sustainability, social infrastructure, uh, architectural alchemy, and, and all of them, we've tried to materialize them in a, in a very specific way for like that particular project, or always with a, with a tiny tweak, changing the status quo a little bit uh, further. Um, but I think what we're experiencing now is that by having been faithfully committed to, to those ideas uh, over such a long time, suddenly it, we, we start actually having opportunities where, I mean, to, to start with, we'll be, we'll be doing it in Dubai, but, but where we can start in a meaningful way to actually dream about a future that, that feels like science fiction, um, but I think it eventually could uh, very easily become a science fact. <laughs> yes. <laughs>